The knight in chess is an interesting piece. Its moves are L-shaped, meaning it can move two squares either up, down, left, or right, and then one square in a perpendicular direction. Depending on where the knight is placed, it always has two to eight squares that it can jump to, assuming that there are no other pieces on the board, of course. But let's make things a bit more interesting here. Let's eliminate the borders and create an infinitely large chessboard. So now the knight always has eight squares that it can jump to, regardless of where it's located. Now, in an effort to examine the knight's reach, I propose the following question. How many distinct squares can the knight end up on after it has moved 100 times? In other words, if we assume some arbitrary starting point, then after successfully making 100 moves, how many different squares can the knight potentially be on? Keep in mind, the knight can use all 100 moves to go as far out as it pleases, but it can also use the same square more than once, and so a back and forth maneuver like this one is not out of the question. And just a heads up, try not to make the mistake of including all the squares that the knight comes in contact with along the way to 100 moves. Unless, of course, any of those squares are also squares that the knight can potentially end up on after 100 moves. Here's your chance to pause the video, if you'd like to think about it some more before we go through it together. Alright, the first thing you might have noticed is that with each move the knight makes, the color of the square that the knight is on alternates between black and white. So since 100 is an even number, then after making 100 moves, the knight can only end up on squares whose color reflects that of the starting square, which in this case is white. Now sure, we just ruled out 50% of all the squares, which may seem like a huge leap in progress, but at the end of the day, half of infinity is still infinity. So unfortunately, this doesn't do all that much to help us reach the answer, but it is a detail to keep in mind as we move forward. Let's instead examine smaller instances of the puzzle and see if we can pick up on any useful insight. Let S of n represent the number of distinct squares the knight can end up on after making an n number of moves. And without loss of generality, let's assume that the knight starts on a white square. As we've already seen, after making one move, the knight can end up on eight distinct squares. After two moves, the knight can end up on 33 distinct squares. And after only three moves, we're already up to 76 distinct squares. You can probably see how this number will quickly start to get out of hand. So trying to solve the puzzle manually is a route we should try to avoid. Which means if you assumed we'd have to come up with some sort of formula, which we could then plug 100 into to get the answer we were looking for, then you're on the right track. The only question now is, how do we find this magical formula? Well, let's go back and take a closer look at how the knight maneuvers. For the first instance, if we replace the knights with points and draw some lines to connect the outermost points, we'll find that this creates an octagon, which I guess is interesting. Let's try doing the same with the second instance and see if anything else sticks out. Okay, this time in addition to the white squares on the octagon's border, all of the white squares within the octagon, with the exception of only four of them, are potential ending squares for the knight. Still nothing too significant here, so let's look at the third instance and see if anything changes. Alright, this is interesting. After three moves, every black square lying on and within the octagon is a potential ending square for the knight. And in case you're wondering, this isn't a coincidence. If we take a look at the fourth instance, we'll find this to be the case as well, with every white square this time on and within the surrounding octagon being a potential ending square for the knight. In fact, this pattern is consistent for every value of n greater than or equal to 3, and it isn't too difficult to prove with some mathematical induction, which I'll let you do on your own if you'd like to take the time to confirm it. Okay, great, now that we know this fact, it'll be much easier to devise a function with respect to n as we now have some sort of geometric property to work with. As for the outliers with instances 1 and 2, we can deal with them by simply letting our formula be a piecewise function, with the first two instances representing the cases when n is equal to 1 and 2 respectively. And so the formula we want to come up with will be viable for all values of n greater than or equal to 3. So let's go back to the third instance and try to find a way to count up all the black squares lying on and within the surrounding octagon. The first thing we want to do is partition the octagon into a central rectangle and two congruent trapezoids above and below the rectangle. The rectangle is made up of four rows with seven reachable squares in each, interposed with three rows with six reachable squares in each. As for the trapezoids, if we look at the one on top, the row at the boundary of the octagon consists of four reachable squares, or n plus one, 
And as we go down the trapezoid, we keep adding an extra reachable square with each new row until we hit the row consisting of 6 reachable squares, or 2n. Multiplying this entire sum by 2 and simplifying a bit yields the following. And finally, putting everything together, we get the following formula. Now, by this point, you might have noticed something that may or may not be a crucial detail. See, if we try counting up all the white squares lying on and within this octagon, we'll find that the number comes out to 69 and not 76, which is what s of 3 is equal to. Meaning, for any octagon for any given value of n, the number of white squares lying on and within it is never the same as the number of black squares lying on and within it. So how can we be sure that the formula we just derived will work for both odd and even values of n? Since, you know, when n is odd, we're counting up the black squares, while when n is even, we're counting up the white ones. Well, to answer that question, we should probably take a look at the fourth instance to check if our geometric reasoning stays intact. And funny enough, it does. We still have a central rectangle made up of n plus 1 rows with 2 n plus 1 reachable squares, interposed with n rows with 2 n reachable squares. And similarly, we have trapezoids that start with n plus 1 reachable squares at the octagon's boundary and eventually go up to 2 n reachable squares. Alright, great, just like that, we have our formula for all values of n greater than or equal to 3. And so, plugging 100 into this, we can see that the number of distinct squares that the knight can end up on after making 100 moves comes out to 70,401. Okay, here's a similar question for you to think about. How many distinct squares can the king end up on after making 100 moves on an infinite chessboard? And for those who are unfamiliar, the king moves to any neighboring square, whether it's horizontally, vertically, or diagonally. Leave your thoughts and answers in the comments below. And if you enjoyed the video, please don't forget to leave a like, it really helps the channel out a lot. And while you're at it, subscribe to stay tuned for the many more math videos coming very soon.